Good day. In my programmes over the last few days, I have been discussing the steady deterioration in US-China relations and the steady rise in tension between the United States and China over the status and future status of the island of Taiwan. The government of Taiwan, I call it a government because though I appreciate many people in China would object to that description, but it is what it calls itself, and I'm not going to go behind that. The government, or if you prefer the political authority in Taiwan, clearly envisages Taiwanese independence from China. It wants China and Taiwan to become separate countries. It no longer claims to be the legitimate government of China itself. It sees Taiwan as a separate entity, and it has been making for some time now steady and gradual moves towards independence. By contrast, the um, Chinese, of course, continue to insist that Taiwan is a part of China, and that China has sovereignty over Taiwan, and that it insists that one day, at some point, Taiwan and uh, the rest of China will reunite. And if you read Chinese media commentaries discussing the Chinese China-Taiwan uh, issue, they're always very careful to, to speak of the Chinese mainland and the island of Taiwan, because, of course, both Taiwan and the Chinese mainland are, as far as the Chinese are concerned, part of China. China being the one indivisible country of which Taiwan is a part. And the United States has been caught in an unusual position where it initially sponsored the setting up of the independent political system in Taiwan in the 1950s when it backed the Chinese nationalist government that established itself there after its defeat in the Chinese Civil War, which was won by the Chinese Communist Party. And so, in a sense, it is the sponsor of Taiwan and of the political system and the economic system which exists there. At the same time, back in the 1970s, for all kinds of geopolitical reasons, it recognized China as the one legitimate uh, entity that unites both China and Taiwan and recognized that Beijing, the government in Beijing, is the legitimate government of the whole of China. And that may means that the United States ever since has followed a policy of calculated ambiguity towards Taiwan, continuing to provide it some degree of implicit support, continuing to trade and deal and uh, um, deal with it actively, whilst at the same time uh, uh, saying that it recognizes Taiwan as part of China and no longer having formal diplomatic relations with the government or political authority in Taiwan, in the Taiwanese capital, Taipei. And as we've seen over the last few uh, years, uh, and especially over the last few months, as Taiwan has edged towards declaring itself independent of China, pol political leaders in the United States, and at times the United States government itself, have appeared to support this and have appeared to hint that they too might be willing to recognize Taiwan's independence of China when that comes. So this has created growing tensions between China and the United States. And the Chinese have been publishing increasingly strong statements saying that they will never accept Taiwanese independence and that they will fight to prevent that happening. And the Thai Chinese have also been making significant military demonstrations in and around the island of Taiwan, which have escalated very considerably over the last few days, with large numbers of Chinese aircraft flying around the island of Taiwan, including within Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And the situation began to boil over 
or so it appeared over the weekend, with the US government publishing an extraordinary statement in which it appeared to uh, uh, support Taiwan's moves towards it independence. It made The statement made no reference to the one China policy, which whereby the United States recognizes the government in Beijing as the ultimate legitimate authority, not just over the Chinese mainland, but over Taiwan itself. It spoke of Chinese actions as provocative and destabilizing, and it gave a clear indication or impression that it regarded Taiwan as an ally and spoke of democratic Taiwan, thereby appearing to recognize the political structure, the legitimacy of the political structure in Taiwan and treating Taiwan as an ally of the United States, a step which would also implicitly mean that the United States recognizes Taiwan as an independent country. So that was an extraordinarily provocative statement from the Chinese point of view. It led to strong Chinese counter statements and of course it also led to these flight uh, further flights of Chinese aircraft in and around Taiwan inside the Ch Taiwanese air defense self-identification zone. And as I've also discussed in this program, it's clear that some people in the United States were becoming increasingly alarmed by these developments, and a hurried meeting was arranged between Yang Tiechi, a senior Chinese Communist Party official who deals with foreign policy issues, and his opposite number, Jake Sullivan, the uh, by President Biden's national security advisor, which was tacked on to Jake Sullivan's European visit and which took place in Zurich, in Switzerland, yesterday. And we have learned from the Americans and from the Chinese that this meeting went on for an extraordinary six hours. Now, can I just say that is an extremely long meeting by any measure. Um, it's very rare for uh, diplomats, for officials, indeed for presidents and prime ministers, so to sit together, to sit down to, together, and to talk to each other for such a long period of time. And what happened? Is the situation as a result of this meeting better, or is it worse? Well, if we go to the Axios website. Axios being a website which appears to be very close to the Biden-Harris administration and which seems increasingly to be used by the Biden-Harris administration to articulate and pronounce on the way uh, things are going, especially in the foreign policy arena. Um, one might get the impression that things went well at this meeting. And I'm going to turn first to what Axios has to tell us about what actually happened. And it says that uh, President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping have reached an agreement in principle to hold a virtual meeting before the end of the year, according to a senior administration official. Now, we're not told who the senior administration official is. I'm going to guess that it is Jake Sullivan himself. But of course, I can't be certain about that. It might be any number of other people. Uh, but that's just that's just the guess. But then it goes on as follows. The White House announcement followed a six hour meeting today in Zurich between White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and his Chinese counterpart Yang Tiechi. White House National Security. Uh, it, it will be. Uh, and then and then we go on to read a great deal more about this uh, uh, meeting from Axios. And it goes on to say that um, the uh, uh, Biden administration views personal diplomacy between the two leaders, that's to say Biden and Xi, to be key to managing the high stakes, at times confrontational relationship between the US and China. 
the Zurich talks marked the most senior level meeting between US and Chinese officials since a frosty Alaska summit in March, where Yang publicly chided Sullivan and Secretary of State Antony Blinken for challenging Beijing on human rights and other issues. A senior official who briefed reporters on condition of anonymity, said that the meeting between Yang and uh, Sullivan took on a different tone than Anchorage, stressing that Sullivan and Yang were able to have a candid and wide-ranging discussion away from the usual talking points. The official called the Zurich meeting the most in-depth conversation that the Biden administration has had with China characterizing it as an important step in providing a foundation to avoid miscalculations that could cause competition to veer into conflict. Sullivan raised issues in which the Chinese and uh, the US have a mutual interest in cooperating, like climate change, as well as concerns over Beijing's human rights abuses in Western China, Hong Kong, and military activities in the South China Sea the official said. And then we come to some of the problems. Asked for any single area where the US and China were currently able to work productively or had made any tangible progress. However, the official did not name one. China had previously told the Americans that if they want a more productive relationship, including on issues like climate change, they should stop criticizing Beijing's behavior. Sullivan again raised the administration's position that climate change must be dealt with separately from other issues in the relationship, the official said, whilst cautioning, I don't think he necessarily accepted our view. What we are trying to achieve is a steady state between the United States and China where we are able to compete intensely but to manage that competition responsibly. So let's just unpack this. This is from Axios. And what we learn is that they did in fact meet. Sullivan and uh, um, Yang Tiechi did in fact meet and that there was an in-depth conversation, perhaps a a more in-depth conversation than any other that the two sides have had since the Biden-Harris administration took office. Well, it did last for six hours, but it turns out that it was all back and forth, and in fact, it doesn't seem as if anything successful was achieved. Um, The Americans tried again to get the Chinese to agree to divide uh, uh, issues where uh, the United States wants China's cooperation and the Chinese are expected to work productively with the US, like climate change, and to get them to agree to uh, accept, essentially, American criticisms and lectures on all other topics where the United States doesn't want to cooperate with China. And it seems that Yang Tiechi repeatedly came back and said that this was unacceptable. So this doesn't look like any sort of breakthrough. It looks like a back and forth, rather tense, perhaps angry discussion in which no progress was achieved on any topic at all. As the uh, administration um, official, who was quoted by Axios, was obliged to admit when asked to define what issue, what matter the Chinese and the Americans are currently cooperating about, he was unable to name a single one. And the one thing that the Americans believe they've come away with from this um, meeting is a Chinese agreement in principle to a virtual meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping. And the Americans seem to be staking a huge amount on these one-to-one meetings between the US president and the Chinese leader. 
but the Chinese only seem to have agreed to that in principle. They have not, in fact, contrary to some of the spin, actually agreed to, su to such a meeting. Clearly, the terms of that meeting are still very up, much up for discussion. And one wonders whether the Chinese will agree to a meeting with the American president, virtual or otherwise, unless some progress is made um, in the discussions with the United States adjusting its position in a way that is desired by Beijing. And if you go to the uh, State Department readout, what you discover is their account of the meeting. This is the official account, which goes beyond what the Axios website account says. And you can start to see some of the problems. And I'm going to read out this readout. I'm going to read out this readout from the, actually it's a White House web, uh, readout. I'm going to read it out in full. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan today met with Chinese Communist Party Politburo member and director of the Office of the Foreign Affairs Commission, Yang Tiechi, in Zurich, Switzerland. Their meeting followed up on the September 9th phone call between President Biden and President Xi, in which the leaders discussed the importance of maintaining open lines of communication to responsibly manage the competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Mr. Sullivan also raised areas where the United States and the PRC have an interest in working together to address vital transnational challenges and ways to manage risks in our relationship. Mr. Sullivan named, raised a number of areas where we have concerns with the PRC's actions, including related actions related to human rights, Western China, Hong Kong, the South China Sea and Taiwan. Mr. Sullivan made clear that while we continue to invest in our national strength and work closely with our allies and partners, we will also continue to engage with the PRC at a senior level to ensure responsible competition. Now, notice that there is no concession there, no sign of any shifting of the American position on any topic. The Americans in this readout are making all the same points that they've always made, and at the same time, they still want Chinese cooperation on topics like China, uh, climate change. But notice two other important facts about this readout. The first is that nowhere in it is there any reference to the One China policy or to the United States recognizing the One China policy, despite the inclusion of the question of Taiwan in the list of issues where uh, Sullivan apparently disagreed with Yang Tiechi. But notice also that nowhere in this readout is there any reference to any points of agreement between Yang and Sullivan at all? Nowhere in the readout is there any suggestion or hint that the Chinese and the Americans were able to agree about anything. We learn that, Mr. Uh, that uh, Jake Sullivan asked for Chinese cooperation on issues of concern to the United States like climate change, and we also learn that he continued to insist on the US position on human rights, Western China, Hong Kong, the South China Sea, and Taiwan. He said that he wants, the US wants to engage with the PRC at a senior level. That's clearly the reference to this request for a summit meeting to ensure responsible competition. But we get no clue from the readout that Yang Tiechi agreed to any of this. So it looks, on the face of it, like deadlock. And the attempt, the rather feeble attempt by Axios to cast a positive spin on it, looks very threadbare when one reads the actual White House readout. Well, that's what the Americans are saying. What are the Chinese saying? And in fact, here 
we have all sorts of uh, rather interesting comments from the Chinese. And first of all, we have a very detailed readout provided by the Foreign Ministry setting out the Chinese account of the Yang Tiechi uh, Jake Sullivan conversation. And again, I'm going to read it out in full. On October 6th, 2021 local time, member of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee and director of the Office of the Central Commission for Foreign Affairs, Yang Tiechi, met with US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Zurich, Switzerland. The two sides had a comprehensive, candid and in-depth exchange of views on China-US relations and international and regional issues of common concern. The meeting was conduced, constructive and conducive to enhancing mutual understanding. Now, before I proceed, um, I've already explained that sometimes one can gauge a great deal um, about the way in which talks took place from the language used in readouts to discuss the general atmosphere. So what we learn is that they were comprehensive, candid and in-depth exchange of views. Candid suggests less something less fierce than frank. So there wasn't an all-out row, but there was a exchange of views, things going backwards and forwards, and uh, apparently little ground being made. However, the meeting is described as constructive, in which suggests that the Chinese felt that they were able to put their points across and conducive to mutual understanding, enhancing mutual understanding, which suggests that they hope that the United States has now a better idea of China's opinions about the various issues that are in contention between them. So not a warm and not a friendly conversation. Instead, a candid, in-depth and comprehensive one in which the Chinese were able to spell out their opinions about things to the United States. And then it, it continues. The two sides agreed to take action following the spirit of the phone call between the Chinese and U.S. heads of state on September 10th, strengthen strategic communication, properly manage differences, avoid conflict and confrontation, seek mutual benefits and win-win results, and work together to bring China-U.S. relations back on the right track of sound and steady development. So the Chinese are trying to get the Americans to be more cooperative and there's agreements to have enhanced communications but note that there is no commitment here to a summit meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping. The American readout, the official White House readout, hinted at such a meeting but didn't actually speak of one. The Axios report talks of a meeting but the Chinese are merely talking at this point about strengthening strategic head commun strategic communication. They're not talking yet about a summit. Anyway, we then go on to read more from the website, from the Chinese reader. Yang Chi pointed out that whether China and the United States can handle their relations well bears on the fundamental interests of the two countries and two peoples, as well as the future of the world. When China and the United States cooperate, the two countries and the world will benefit. When China and the United States are in confrontation, the two countries and the world will suffer severely. The US side needs to have a deep understanding of the mutually beneficial nature of China-US relations and correctly understand China's domestic and foreign policies and strategic intentions. China opposes defining China-US relations as competitive. Yang Chechi said, 
China attaches importance to the positive remarks on China-U.S. relations made recently by U.S. President Joe Biden. And China has noticed that the United States side says it has no intention of containing China's development and does not seek a new Cold War. That, by the way, all of that, by the way, is a reference to President Biden's recent UN General Assembly address in which he appeared to be making some conciliatory comments about China. But then it goes on to say, the readout goes on to say, China hopes the US side could adopt a rational and pragmatic China policy and, together with China, respect each other's core interests and major concerns and follow a path of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation. So those are the two core paragraphs in the readout. And what they're telling us, straightforwardly, is that Yang Jiechi, like Xi Jinping before him, like other Chinese leaders, are telling the US that China-US relations are a package, a package that cannot be broken up and unwound into its various parts. It is in US interests to have good relations with China. It is in China's interests to have good relations with the US. It is in the world's interests that the China and the US have good relations with each other. But in order for that to happen, the United States needs to respect China and understand China's red lines, its core interests, and treat China with respect. Unless it does so, unless it accepts that China-US relations are one package, then there will be no progress on any one part of that package, irrespective of whether the United States wants to see that, and relations instead will go on deteriorating as they have done. Moreover, US policy of trying to break up the relationship with China, the the issues in the relationship between the US and China, into various segments or different parts, with the US and China working constructively on some, but arguing and quarrelling about others, is, by implication, irrational and utopian. I say that because what uh, the readout says is that um, Yang Chi um, asked Sullivan to and the United States to go to adopt a rational and pragmatic China policy, which by implication, of course, means that the current policy that the United States is following is neither rational nor pragmatic. It is, by implication, irrational and utopian. The United States cannot have its cake and eat it as well. It cannot treat China as an enemy on some matters and as a partner on other matters, especially when it seeks China's partnership on those issues which concern the United States, but shows no willingness to do the same on those issues which concern China. Moreover, when the United States treats China as an enemy on those issues which concern China, that de- disincentivizes China from working in cooperation with the United States on those issues which concern the United States. And then the readout goes on as follows. Yan Chi expounded China's solemn position on issues related to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Western China and human rights, as well as maritime issues. The latter, of course, is a reference to the South China Sea, urging the United States side to truly respect China's sovereignty, security and development interests and stop using the above issues to interfere in China's internal affairs. 
The US side expressed its adherence to the one China policy. Now, this is, I think, going to become an increasing bone of contention because we learnt from the Chinese readout of the Biden C call that the United States or that Joe Biden told C that the United States adheres to the one China policy. In other words, it continues to recognize Taiwan as a part of China and the government in Beijing as the sole legitimate authority over uh, mainland China and Taiwan. And it seems that Sullivan, in his conversation with Yang Chi, did the same thing. But even though the United States says that in private to Chinese officials and leaders, in its own public readouts of its interchanges with those Chinese officials and leaders, it makes no reference to this. On the contrary, it continues to speak of Taiwan as if it was an independent country in a sense, giving the impression that it doesn't really believe the one, in the one China policy anymore, that the one China policy is something that is only symbolic and only comes up in discussions with the Chinese. And in fact, on the very day that Jake Sullivan was speaking to Yang Chechi and giving those kind of assurances about the Chinese the one China policy to Yang Chi, Chi. Tony Biden, uh, Tony, uh, Anthony Biden, the U.S. Secretary of State, was saying this in whilst on another whilst in conversation with the media um, over the Iran issue. With regard to Taiwan, I have to tell you and reiterate that we are very concerned by the PRC's provocative military activity near Taiwan. As we said, the activity is destabilizing. It risks miscalculation and it has the potential to undermine regional peace and stability. So we strongly urge Beijing to cease its military, diplomatic and economic pressure and coercion directed at Taiwan. We have, the United States has, a commitment to Taiwan that is rock solid and over many years has contributed to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and within the region. And we will continue to stand with friends, with allies, to advance shared prosperity, shared security, shared values, as well as continue to deepen our ties with a democratic Taiwan. Now, that is almost word for word the same as was said in that incredibly provocative statement that the State Department published on Sunday. And it makes me wonder whether, in fact, it was Antony Blinken who actually drafted that incredibly provocative statement. But, as I said when I discussed that statement, the Chinese are bound to read in these comments that Blinken is making a effective repudiation of the One China policy. Blinken nowhere refers to the One China policy in these comments. He talks about a commitment to Taiwan that is rock solid, in other words, a commitment to Taiwan by implication against China. It talks about uh, Taiwan by implication as being a friend and an ally. And it talks about shared values with Taiwan. And it talks about our ties with a democratic Taiwan appearing, appearing to recognize the, the different political system in Taiwan and treating it as a legitimate one and one separate from China and one with which the United States is in effect allied. So we see Jake Sullivan, like Joe Biden before him, telling the Chinese one thing in private and Tony Blinken saying in public something completely different. And we see that the United States, in its public statements, 
nowhere refers or acknowledges any longer the existence of the one China policy, which it in private tells the Chinese that it is still it still adheres to and is bound by. Now, I think that not only are these statements that Blinken is making incredibly provocative from a Chinese point of view, but that the Chinese will read all of these statements and compare them with each other. They will note what the Americans are saying in public and compare it with what the Americans are saying to them in private. And inevitably, they will come round to the view that the Americans are being duplicitous and cannot be trusted. I've discussed many times how the United States has an amateur approach to foreign policy. And here we see an example. It seems that American officials do not understand that, an that another government, especially a government like China, is perfectly capable of comparing the public comments of US officials with their private ones, noticing the discrepancy between what is said in public and what is said in private, and reaching the conclusion that what is being said to them in private by the United States is insincere. I cannot imagine anything that will sour relations between two governments more than that and create an atmosphere of distrust. A straightforward admission by the United States to the Chinese that the United States is finding it increasingly difficult to abide by its one, the one China policy because of the political pressures that the United States now finds itself under because of the growing competition with Beijing would be a much more straightforward and honest approach and one which I suspect the Chinese would m far more respect than this extraordinary duplicity that the Americans are showing on this topic. But anyway, to return to the Chinese readout of the Sullivan Yang Che Chi talks. We read that the two sides also exchange views on climate change and regional issues of common concern. The Americans talk all the time about climate change. The Chinese relegate that to an, after, to an afterthought in the reader. And we also learn that the two sides agree to maintain regular dialogue and communication on important issues, which is more, by the way, than the American readout says, but it certainly falls far below any agreement to have an actual summit meeting. Well, that's what we learn from the official Chinese readout. But, of course, the Chinese just have provided commentaries about what actually happened in the Yang Chi and Sullivan talks, just as the Americans have done with that article in Axios. And these commentaries, of course, are provided where else in global times. And it is to those commentaries that I will now turn. And there's been a fairly lengthy article about the Yang Sullivan meeting in global times. And it is rather ominously entitled, Yang Sullivan meeting showcases positive signals, major diver divergence. So clearly, things we see did not go entirely well. There's clearly a major divergence. And the article then goes on to say, Positive signals for improving deteriorating China-US ties and a major divergence on expectations of bilateral ties were on display at the same time during the meeting between Yang Chi and Jake Sullivan. China opposed defining China-US bilateral ties as competitive, while the US carried on with that label Analysts said 
noting that China insists on seeking cooperation with the United States, but he's also preparing for the worst. Yang, a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee and director of the Office of the Foreign Affairs Commission of the CPC Central Committee, had a comprehensive and in-depth exchange of views on China-US relations, as well as international and regional issues of common concern with Sullivan on Wednesday. The meeting was described as constructive and conducing to, conducive to enhancing mutual understanding. The, the two sides agreed to take action following the spirit of the phone call between the Chinese and US heads of state in September. The Wednesday meeting was the first face-to-face -face meeting between Yang and Sullivan since their exchanges in Alaska in March. It also took place half a month after the telephone call between Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden. And um, then the Chinese do discuss the possibility that there might be a meeting between the US and Chinese leaders, but they say it's fairly clear that this is a tentative discussion. And then they go on to discuss the Sullivan-Yang meeting as follows. A high-level high board meeting would be helpful and timely to improve the current worrying state of US-China relations. The meeting showed that both China and the US are willing to enhance strategic communication. Uh, the meeting, which lasted six hours, achieved some positive results. It is also important to see the two sides implementing the spirit of the phone conversation between C and Biden and talking about disputes and the possibilities of cooperation. The atmosphere of the meeting was better than Yang's and Sullivan's last meeting in Alaska. Uh, and experts reached by Global Times believe that nearly 10 months after Biden took office, it appears that the United States is planning to put an end to its reckless and unrealistic strategy of dealing with China from a position of strength and may enter a pragmatic and strategic stalemate stage where competition exists alongside comprehensive, concrete cooperation. Despite the positive signals, differences in expectation for future bilateral ties were clear during the Yang-Sullivan meeting. Yang said during the meeting that the US side needs to have a deep understanding of the mutually beneficial nature of China-US relations and correctly understand China's domestic and foreign policies and strategic intentions. China opposes defining China-US relations as competitive. However, by contrast, the readout of the meeting released by the White House mentioned competition twice, saying that Yang and Sullivan's meeting followed up C and Biden's phone conversation in September, in which the leaders discussed the importance of maintaining open lines of communication to responsibly manage competition between China and the U.S., Sullivan also said that the U.S. will also continue to engage with the PRC at a senior level to ensure com responsible competition. The releases show that China and the U.S. take a different approach in defining bilateral ties. Yang emphasized that China-U.S. ties should be improved as the relationship impacts the fundamental interests of the two countries as well as the world. He reiterated mutual benefit, while China Sullivan attached less importance to this factor. Sullivan still stressed developing ties with U.S. allies and strengthening self-building of the U.S., China, but China is not like the U.S. allies or its other partners, as the U.S. is still dividing the world by forming small cliques, which is opposite to China's stance. Uh, 
Both China and the US mentioned the questions related to, to, to China's western regions, Hong Kong and Taiwan in their statements. During, Yang, during the meeting, Yang expounded China's solemn position on these questions, urging the United States to truly respect China's sovereignty, security and development interests and stop using these issues to interfere in China's internal affairs. The US side expressed its adherence to the One China policy. The White House readout, by contrast, noted that Sullivan raised, a num raised these issues where the US is concerned with the PRC's actions, including actions related to all of the issues under discussion. In the Chinese version, the Chinese side put this part at the end, and the majority of the release stressed the importance of implementing the guidance of top leaders and managing disputes. Whilst the US made this part, the issues in contention, its main focus, the comparison shows China is focused on coordination and cooperation, whilst the US is still trying to manage bilateral ties by pushing those topics it is interested in. The differences between the two sides are obvious, it is unrealistic to expect the Yang Sullivan meeting to further change US ties, China US ties, since it has become a bipartisan consensus to have competition with China. The US has continued its previous policies towards China, but also added something new shoring up US strength, drawing up allies, and enhancing conversation with China, but competing with China remains unchanged. Although the Biden administration hasn't put in place very dramatic China policies, it has still embraced the Cold War mentality and is assembling its allies in order to contain China. China seeks cooperation with the US, but is also prepared for the worst scenario if the United States takes any unexpected action against China, especially on sensitive questions such as the island of Taiwan. And then on the topic of the possible meeting between Xi Jinping and Biden, the Chinese uh, Global Times notice note that there's been no statement to that effect about such a meeting taking place from the Chinese side. So that is a factual discussion from Global Times. It makes the point that the Americans are still trying to have their cake and eat it. They still want Chinese cooperation on issues that are of interest to the United States, like, like climate change, but they still want to treat China as an enemy on all others. They still feel they have a license to interfere in what the Chinese see as their internal affairs on the basis of values, human rights, if you like, and the US's position on human rights. And the Chinese reject that utterly. And there is no real meeting of minds between the United States and China. Um, and this meeting appears to have come away with the US and China no closer to finding a modus vivendi to agree with each other. And notice again how this Global, artic Global Times article again spoke, speaks about the need for China and the US to move towards agreeing a stalemate position they're not looking for friendship with the United States. They're looking for a geopolitical ceasefire with the United States, in which the United States acknowledges that China has core interests and red lines over Taiwan and the South China Sea. But this is apparently not being understood or listened to by the Americans. And... I would add that there's also been a strong uh, editorial, predictably, from Glo Global Times, um, and it reads that uh, the Zurich meeting can bear fruit, but then it goes on to say, 
if we compare the press releases from both sides, there are serious differences between the two countries. Yang stressed that China opposes defining China-US relations as competitive. He advocated a deep understanding of the mutually beneficial nature of bilateral relations and correctly understanding China's domestic and foreign policies and strategic intentions. However, the US press release mentions competition twice, and it talks only about managing responsible competition. And then the Global Times editorial goes on to say, it is obvious that Washington's strategic definition of the China-US relations and the basic thinking behind their policy towards Beijing remains the same. The State Department's press release emphasized that it will continue to invest in US national strength and work closely with allies and partners. This is the same as the US's oft-repeated theme of speaking from a position of strength and strengthening the alliance system to fiercely com compete with China. However, the US side has recently talked less about confrontation, a little more about cooperation. It appears to be looking for ways to manage uh, that cooperation more whilst downplaying the competition. And then it goes on to say, the editorial goes on to say, China's fundamental strategy of not making principled concessions and insisting on doing its own thing is taking effect. The US side always says it wants to speak from a position of strength, but its strength is far from sufficient to achieve its ambitions to contain China's development. And, uh, and, we will st and then it goes on to say, reality has taught Washington a crisp lesson. The US has to alleviate some conflicts with China, which are out of its ability. It also adjusted the pace of its China policy. It must be noted that we have a strong endurance in sticking to the current path towards the United States. The US strategy towards China is very imaginative, which is, by the way, a polite way of saying unrealistic, but it cannot be supported by its ability. While the US is repeatedly discussing infrastructure construction, China's infrastructure construction has taken another step forward. The United States' alliance system is becoming more and more complicated. For example, Paris, Washington's traditional ally, is angry with Washington. Berlin is still going against Washington's will on Nord Stream 2. The US's failure in Afghanistan has made all of Washington's allies bitterly disappointed. The United States cannot achieve these deeds effortlessly. However, China can accumulate strategic initiatives by doing its own things well. China follows a pragmatic and reliable path. And then the editorial finishes. We hope to see China-US relations find constructive changes. However, there are still many obstacles for the two sides to move closer in terms of their perceptions and expectations towards each other. The US has a deep hegemonic mindset and it won't engage in reflection until it fails. China must, by doing its own things well, make the US realize that ultimately it is impossible to contain China's development. By sticking to this approach and direction, US's China policy will gradually adapt to reality. The US will seek maximum interests by exploring cooperation and coexistence with China. So what the Global Times editorial is saying is that the United States has not changed its approach to China in any fundamental way. It continues to seek cooperation from China on issues that are of interest to the United States, but it still insists on treating China as an enemy on all those issues which are important to China. But the very fact 
that this meeting with Yang Chi was arranged in such, a, in such haste shows that the Americans are becoming alarmed by China's actions and the fact that the Americans are talking recently about uh, cooperation with China more than about confrontation with China suggests that the hard line that the Chinese are taking is starting to cut through and that the Americans are starting to understand the strength of China's position and that if China continues with its hard line then sooner or later the Americans out of their own self-interest and desire for self-preservation will eventually come round and will come round to the Chinese point of view. So there we see the fundamental difference in outlook and the extraordinary difference with which the two sides came to this meeting and the extent to which, in my opinion, this meeting, far from actually resolving misunderstandings, appears instead to have enhanced them. The Americans went to this meeting. They made all their various points to the Chinese. They accept that they didn't get the Chinese to make any concessions at all. But they think that because the Chinese listened politely to all that they had to say, that the Chinese are finally engaging with the Americans in the way that the Americans want them to. And they've come away with some hopes that there will be some sort of a summit meeting between Biden and Xi this year. So the Americans are convinced or have convinced themselves that their policy of talking tough to the Chinese on some issues and at the same time trying to get the Chinese to work with them on issues of interest to the US, like climate change and the pandemic, that that's working. The Chinese have gone to this meeting between Yang Chi and Sullivan, and they've come away with a diametrically opposite impression. They think that the very fact that this meeting was convened at all, that the Americans came to it in such a hurry, alarmed as they clearly were by the situation in and around Taiwan, proves that it is China's hard line which is working. The Americans sat and listened quietly as the Chinese explained to the Americans their red line, China's red lines and what China's core interests are. And the fact that the Americans were prepared to listen to all of that proves that so long as China sticks by its hard line, the Americans will eventually, at some point, come round. In other words, each side has come away from this meeting believing that its hard line is paying off with the other. Now... I think that this is utterly and completely wrong. And I'm going to say straight away that I think the biggest miscalculation here is being made by the United States. I think that the United States assumes that the Chinese are edging towards America, the American position. Whereas, as I said, the Chinese, far from making any concession to the Chinese, to the Americans, even Axios, even that official who spoke to Axios, had to uh, concede as much. The Chinese, on the contrary, are waiting for the Americans to bend. Each side continues to believe that the other is bluffing. Each side hopes at the same time that along with this bluff, <laughs> the bluff, the other side is going to back down and each side at the same time wants to try and find some way of controlling things on the ground until this eventual climb down takes place. I think that both sides are wrong. I think that the Chinese certainly are going to stick with that hard line. And I think that the Americans, as I said, are making the bigger miscalculation in thinking that the Chinese are eventually going to back down. 
because as far as the Chinese are concerned, Taiwan is a core interest, which it is not for the United States. Now, what is going to happen? I think that over the next few weeks, we will see more American attempts to get this summit arranged between Biden and Xi. And the fact that we're only talking about a virtual summit already tells us that this is going to be not a real summit at all, but more like a glorified telephone call. I think the Chinese are going to bait the Americans. They're going to offer or dangle this prospect of a, ch of a summit to get the Americans to make concessions to the Chinese on various issues with the summit held out as some sort of reward. But as just as the Biden-Putin summit back in June ended up resolving nothing between the United States and Russia, so a summit meeting between Biden and Xi is going to resolve nothing between the China and the United States, given the enormous differences that exist between the two countries. To my mind, all that the Sullivan Yang meeting has done is highlight the, the vast scale of these differences and the depth of misunderstanding between these two countries. In the meantime, the United States thinks that if it deals with China from a position of strength, then China will back down. China is convinced, on the contrary, that it is in the stronger position and it too will go about making its position stronger still by continuing to build up its armed forces along the Taiwan Strait and elsewhere. And the Taiwanese authorities today have said that by 2025, China will be in a military position where it will feel confident in launching a war against Taiwan. So there we are, a meeting which, in my opinion, has done, has achieved nothing. All it has really done is show how far apart the two sides are, how the extent to which the United States still doesn't really understand China, the extent to which the Chinese are finding it difficult to get the Americans to understand them, and the way in which it's likely that things between these two countries are going to deteriorate and get worse. I suspect that over the next few weeks and months, over the course of this year, as these attempts to try to set up this meeting, this virtual meeting between Biden and C continue, we will perhaps see a slight relaxation in tensions. But overall, the readouts, the statements made by the two governments following this meeting can only fill one with foreboding. It seems that neither side is prepared to make significant concessions to each other, to the other, the major concessions, the major moves, as I said, have to be made by the United States. The United States still struggles to understand that on this issue the Chinese are not bluffing and that Taiwan is for China an existential issue and therefore a core interest and that if the United States wants to work with China on issues like climate change, the pandemic and the rest, and wishes to avoid a conflict with China, then it will have to make substantive compromises on issues like Taiwan, the South China Sea, and so such matters. I suspect that next year is going to be the key year in the China-US relationship. At that point, it will no longer be possible any longer to paper over the differences. Either the United States grasps the nettle and accepts that it will have to speak to the Chinese and talk to the Chinese in a different way from the way in which it has been doing up to now, or we will see 
relations between China and the United States slide dangerously in around the Taiwan Straits and the eastern and, and the eastern and west and in the Pacific in ways that we cannot imagine up to now. Well, we shall see what comes, but for myself, I am far from confident. In fact, as I said, these readouts fill me with foreboding. Well, another long video, a lot to discuss on this topic. I hope um, I've made my views and the discussions, the nature of the discussions, clear. Um, um, thank you for joining me again today. Remember, you can find me on our main channel, The Duran, where I do my programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. You can also find us on various other platforms, above all locals, where we're now posting lots of um, exclusive content and where, if you join us, you can participate in our thriving community. We can, you can also find us on various other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey and the rest. You can also support us via Patreon and subscribe star and by going to our shop and buying the amazing things you will find there, our hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts and all the rest. Lastly, if you like this video, please remember to tick the like button and please press your, please check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon. And have a wonderful day. Until then.